good evening ev everyone uh, thank you for joining today's recap session my name is Lauren I'm the Basque free coordinator for the EHL recap committee just to quickly introduce uh, our committee we are a officially an EHL committee since this semester we provide material and recap sessions by students for students and uh, today we have Eva our tutor for legal uh, challenges. She has prepared a little presentation and afterwards Q and A. Um, and please do know that we are not accountable for you failing your exams. We're just here to try to help you. Um, and yeah, I'll pass the word on to Eva now. I think, but Laurent will try to send it in the chat room since you made the effort to show up tonight, so you can have access right now. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you, Lauren. You're welcome. And then, okay, let me just share my screen. Can you see the presentation? Yes, we can see it. Okay, I'm just gonna... <laughs> Two seconds. Okay. Um, you're welcome, uh, Max. Um, so basically what I'm just going to do, I'm quickly going to go over like all the contents, everything you should know, but I'm not actually going to present it because I think that's like a bit boring to listen to. So I'm just going to like list all the topics you should be familiar with, basically. And um, then I'm just going to go over, you know, we had all the quizzes in LMS. So I'm just going to go over one difficult question. And I think I'm going to skip over the um, the all the things we had all the things we had to do before the midterm but if anything is unclear you can still ask me about that of course but just because i think that for most people now it's pretty clear since we have the midterm and everything um to practice all of that so yeah so okay so i'm gonna go over the main topics first of what we have so it's like the chapter so i first put introduction to law then we had sorry then we had contract basics, and we had different types of legal forms. Then we had IP, so that was everything we did up to the midterm, right? And then after the midterm, we had privacy and data issue, which is kind of like a, I mean, it's still pretty linked to IP. Then we had employee management. Um, then we had how to run your business, and then how to develop your business. Um, legal negligence, and we ended up with legal, legal neg negligence. <laughs> yeah. And then, okay, so now a bit more detail. So introduction to law, of course, we didn't do that much. As you remember, it was like the first class. So we just defined what is legal risk, the difference between different types of risks and how to interact with your lawyer. Okay, and then for contact basics, so actually I think this is like a super dense chapter, which you should definitely like reread, even if you feel comfortable with it before the midterm, because I'm sure a lot of questions will come up still and it's quite tricky. And I mean, I know personally, like some of the mistakes I made in the midterm were linked to contracts actually. So just make sure you really know everything for contracts. So yeah, we learned about different types of contract, um, when a contract is valid, that is super important, right? And then uh, when is there a meeting of the minds, when is there like object and consent, what happens if there's a breach of contract, and then important clauses like force majeure, liability clauses, dispute resolutions, attrition and payment. Yep. And then for different types of legal form, I think this is also a bit complex actually. So we have the sole proprietorship, partnership, corporation, LLC. So you should really know them and the advantage. But I think also after the project we had to do, most of you know it quite well now. And then the advantages and disadvantages of each company type, as well as the definitions like business judgment rule and corporate veil. And don't confuse them because they're not the same. Um, and then for IP, we had four types of IP, IP, right? So trademark, copyright, patent, and trade secrets. So you just need to know them. We need to know, link to that, the confidentiality clause, the non-compete clause, and um, um, mark infringement or dilution, or sorry, or dilution by tarnishing or dilution by blurring. So don't confuse them as well. Um, and then to move on privacy and data issues. I think it's that topic is not that difficult. So you just need to know what is personal data, which is basically everything, right? Basically everything linked to a person. And then you need to know the difference between copyright infringement, privacy violation, data privacy violation, and data breach. But there's a lot of questions about that on LMS that you can practice with. 
And then you need to be familiar with like terms like peeping tom cases and the Streisand effects. Yep. And then for employee management, we talk mainly about employees and independent contractors and what the differences are. Um, what's an agent? What's a principal? What kind of power does the agent have? Um, then we talked about vicarious liability. Um, and what does it mean, basically? And then, of course, all the legal risks linked to employees like negligent hiring, sexual harassment, and um, discrimination lawsuits as well. So you should be familiar with that. Then for running a business, I think this is probably one of the most complex topics. So first of all, we had owning versus renting. What are the advantages and disadvantages? Then we had FOB from board. I'll get to that later because I think it's actually a bit complicated. And the risk of loss. And then we had terms of lease agreement, um, real property versus personal property. Then we had franchising versus management contract versus franchise for party managed. And then um, we should also be familiar with terms like encroachment, clause of good faith and fair dealings. And then to develop the business, um, you should know what happens if you do a consolidation versus a merger versus a takeover, all of that. For example, what happens to your shares, what happens to your assets as well. And um, to be familiar with successor, su successor liability, what does it mean? Yeah, and then I think the most interesting topic was at the end, so it's the legal negligence. So we need to be able to apply four-step reasoning, maybe just try it on a case study, like one of the ones we saw in class. Um, what is an invitee versus a trespasser? Of course, in legal terms, right? Um, what are different types of damage? What is the shared negligence rule? And then also just make sure you know what is a strict products liability? What is liability without fault? And then what I did, I'm not going to read all of them now because you guys know how to read, so you can do it yourselves. But I made like a bunch of questions basically about all the topics we had for now. And you can use them to, to study because when you study, sometimes it's good instead of just learning by heart, but you try to like retrieve information from your brain, right? So you can try to answer all these questions and some are more general, but some are like really specific about like small details. So yeah. So here, and that's why also it's good to look at the PowerPoint at home because you can just try to answer all these questions. Yep. And then, so I heard that a lot of people are still struggling with the differences between criminal law, civil law, et cetera. So I just want to go over this question real quick. And I think I'm going to do it like last time with the voting. Um, so I will read the question and Wait, let me see. Okay, I will just read it quickly. But Mrs. Stern alleges that on September 15, when she and her husband were guests at the Ritz, Stern made arrangements to receive a massage at the hotel spa. A female attendant took Stern to a small room with a table and told her to disrobe and recline on a table under a sheet. After the attendant left the room, Boris Tanev, the physio, entered, made small talk with Stern, and began the massage. Boris Tanev then sexually assaulted Mrs. Stern, who has managed to escape and run out of the room. Mrs. Stern immediately informed the hotel manager of the assault. Please note that under U.S. law, although specific laws vary, state, vary by state, sexual assault generally refers to any conduct in which the offender subjects the victim to sexual touching that is unwanted and offensive and qualifies as a criminal offense. So the first question is, which branch of law is relevant to this case? So I'm just going to type the different options in the chat and you can vote. So I will let you vote which one you think it is. Wait, wait, Max, I'm going to write it out, don't worry. <laughs> you can't vote for it. <laughs> don't worry, you were too quick. Okay. Wow, I think everyone is agreeing. Yeah, I will explain why. <laughs> I will explain why. So why is it both? Basically, you need to look at um okay, basically you need to look at what exactly happened here, okay? So civil law, it's basically a wrongdoing from one citizen to the other, okay? But it doesn't necessarily have to be a law. Let's say that if I um, have a business and I enter a contract with Isolde, okay, who also has a business, if I breach that contract, 
it's going to be civil law, okay? Because it's something that happened between the two of us, between two citizens. But it's not going to be criminal law because there's no official law that says Eva shouldn't breach a contract of Isolde, right? It's not in a law book. That doesn't exist by law. But it's still wrong, of course. So it's one citizen that does wrong to another. What well, criminal law, it's actual laws that exist, right? So we have US law, French law, blah, blah. In here, actually, you're given a tip because in the assignment, right? So we have like a little presentation of like our case study. And then the last sentence is like, please note that under US law, um, sexual assault generally refers to any kind of blah, blah. So we're actually giving the information that sexual assault is illegal under US law. So that's why here we have criminal law and civil law, right? Civil law, because basically um, the the massage guy, he sexually assaulted Mrs. Stern, which he shouldn't have done, right? So it's one citizen harming another citizen. But then also criminal law, because sexual assault is always illegal um, under the government, basically. I don't know if that made sense. Okay, you're welcome, Ms. Um And then, so... To continue with that, who could take whom to court? So it would be the claimant or his or her family. Wait, let me just type. Or maybe for this, because there's a lot of options, I think you can just type the right option yourself. Maybe just type the right answer, because there's so many options. Right, so there's maybe take a minute to think about it. Yep. <laughs> you're right, you're right. Yeah, you're right. It's faster with numbers. Um Yep, yeah, I think we all agree. So it's five. Because I think if you understand A, you will also understand B, right? So we said that it's two types of laws which are breached, the civil, civil and criminal. And if you look at it here, that means that actually two different legal entities will have to take um, the massage guy or the defendant, the defendant to court, right? So, the court, right? So it's first the, the state because of the criminal law. So it's basically the state that was attacked in that sense, okay? So that's why the state takes the defendant to court, the court. And the claimant takes the family to court as well because of the civil law. Um, yeah, I think if really not, if you understand A, you understand B. And then, okay, which what sanctions would the court be likely to request? So we have fines and or prison, damages or damages at the same time as fines and prison. I will put numbers this time. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yep, yep, yep. So here again, um, why? Because you don't get punished the same way if you breach civil law or if you breach criminal law, okay? So if you breach civil law, it's you hurt just one specific person, so you have to um, do damages to kind of repay that person, right? And actually, most of the time, you will be paying um, for the damages you did. But then if it's criminal law, it's seen, if, if you breach criminal law, basically, you're seen as a threat to society as a whole, right? Because uh, let's say US law, it's supposed to protect society as a whole. So if you disrespect that law, it means that you're a potential threat to society. And that's why we either do fines, if it's more of like maybe like, um, some people would be like fraud or something financial would be more like a fine because you're not that dangerous, right? But if you murdered someone, that's of course also criminal law and that would be prison, right? And so in this sense, because here we have civil law and criminal law again, it means that we have to do damages as well as fine, uh, as yeah, fine or prison. Okay, so just always need to see it that way, like, Criminal law is more general, it's for society, but civil law, it's between you and me, basically. Yep, yep, okay. Um, yeah, the, these ones I will skip over because I think it's okay, but I can get back to it at the end if you want. Um, so this one is about data, just to make sure that you're familiar with like the terminology used, because they all sound a bit similar, but it's not the same, okay? so. Yeah, a professional photographer managed to take a picture of a celebrity walking her dog in her nightclothes. 
this is a privacy issue, a copyright issue, a data privacy issue, or a data protection or data security issue. So let me know what you think. You can vote. Yep. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so it's A, um, it might sound quite easy, but just don't confuse it, like the difference between data privacy and privacy, right? So privacy here is just because her privacy was hurt as a person. Um, she was on a private moment, whatever, you're not supposed to take a picture of her to upload it. Data privacy, it would be, for example, if she shared something on the internet, like her credit card information, and that was somehow stolen, okay? But here, Privacy is basically just a person, and then data would be everything that that person, the output, basically, everything that that person shares. Um, yeah. Oops, no one saw. Um, here, I think this is interesting because this is something that we didn't really see in class. So I just wanted to talk about it quickly. If a would be employee swears to the truth of the information provided at the bottom of the application form, which includes his or her CV. Resume fraud will be in the US. Civil case and a criminal case, civil case or, crim or a criminal case, or an administrative case. So here we're actually back with civil law, criminal law, etc. So you can see if you understood it correctly. Mm -hmm. So for this one, um, you're actually wrong, Max, but when I did the quiz, I got the same thing as you when I was a bit surprised. Um, it's one, okay? So it's both a civil case and a criminal case, but again, this is not really something we saw in class, okay? So civil case is clear because fraud is seen as um, civil law, okay? Because it's you doing another citizen wrong, but then... Here in this case, we really always need to look at the details in the question, right? So here it's like, if the employee swears to the truth of the information provided. And in this case, under US law, if you swear of saying the truth, you know, like you always see like in TV shows when we're like, when we're like on a trial and they swear that they're gonna say the truth no matter what, this is the same case, okay? It's just that here it's with a CV. So it might not seem as serious, but it still is. So as soon as a person swears um, that she is saying the truth and she doesn't, it's perjury. And that is seen as a criminal offense. So that's why in this, here it's both cases, but I just wanted to get over it because I think we didn't really see it in class. So just remember that if you see something similar in the exam. Okay, here this is super easy, but just to make it super clear. Um, a franchisor or franchisee could be a sole proprietorship, a partnership, a limited liability, or a corporation. Is this true or false? Um, this is aha, uh -huh, interesting. Okay, it's good about a service. This is true. So, a French or the franchisee can be anything. And I think here it's important to not confuse basically like so proprietorship, partnership, limited liability, or corporation. These are like your business forms, right? So this is um, this would just define maybe like how many managers you have, if your shares are not, all these things, right? But it doesn't really define how you run the company. And so, of course, a sole proprietorship could, for example, be a franchisee. To give you an example, like maybe if you have a bubble tea shop, you'll only be one person, but you might actually be a franchisee of a really big bubble tea chain. Okay, to give you an example. So actually, you can, of course, be a franchisee no matter what your business form is. So don't confuse it. Like all these things like franchising, licensing agreement, operator and stuff, that's your the way you will manage the business. But it's not your business form. So don't confuse them. 
Okay. Um, excuse me. Yeah. I, I just had a quick question for the previous one. Mm-hmm. Um, because I understand the the point for the franchisee, mm-hmm. but I don't understand for the franchisor. Because the franchisee, of course, it can be a sole proprietorship because uh, because he's only o- owning one shop. But as soon as uh, but I don't get it for the franchisor because the company th- that needs to be a big, quite a big company to get uh, to get uh, franchise ease. Yeah, I mean, I, was, I think like so. I, I think this question is more like theoretical. You know, like of course, if you're like a sole proprietor, you probably not think of becoming a franchiser because you cannot afford it and your brand is not famous. Like you become a franchiser because your brand starts becoming really famous and it makes sense, right? So I think this is more like a theoretical question, but like in theory, no matter um, if you're a sole proprietorship partnership, LLC and stuff, you can be a franchisee or franchise. It's, it's just, I think this question is more to make the point that you shouldn't confuse business form and business model like the way you run it. But yeah, of course, in reality, I think it's very rare, rare for a sole proprietorship to become a franchiser. I agree. But yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's just the way I understood it. So yeah. Yeah, it's all good. Thanks. It was just a clarification. Thank you. But yeah, of course, in real life, I think it will probably not really happen. Um, okay, so this one is with FOB. And I think FOB is a bit confusing, so I included this one. So, Grocers Mart buys 100 cases of berries from Hilltop Farms. The parties agree that the berries will be transported FOB Hilltop Farms via the trucking company. Refrigerator's truck and the berries are lost in a fire following an accident. The loss of berry is suffered by A, B, C, or D. What do you think? I'll let you type. Or if you're like honestly confused, you can also just type that. (laughs) (laughs) Yep, I understand. Okay, Lohan says C. Um, Let's have a look. So it's actually A. So Maximilian was right. Um, why is it? It's okay, though. <laughs> why, why is it grocery? So actually, what does FOB mean? I think it's a bit confusing. So I think FOB, like if you look at the whole uh, wording, it means free on board. And it's coming from like before with like when we only used to do shipping by um, actual ships, you know. Um, but now the way it's used now. So to look at this example specifically, FOB Hilltop Farms, what does it mean? It means that as soon as Hilltop Farms has shipped out the berries, they don't have responsibility over the berries anymore. So the risk of loss will be bared by Grocers Mart. Um, so basically you can imagine it like this, like if it says, FOB describes like until under which responsibility the product is, okay? So if it's FOB held up farms, it means that as soon as held up farms has sent it, they're not responsible for it anymore. If it said FOB, um, what is it? Yeah, FOB grocers, it means that grocers will only be responsible for the product once that they've received it. And so if that was the case, right? That means that the loss of value would have been suffered by Hilltop. Okay, so that would have been the other way around. So basically, FOB, you need to imagine it if if it's FOB for the shipping company, the sender, let's say like that. If it's FOB for the sender, okay, so if you see an excess like this and it says FOB sender, it means that as soon as the sender has sent the product, they're not responsible anymore. If it says FOB buyer, okay, it means that they will only be, the buyer will only be responsible for the product when they receive it. I think that's the way you need to remember it. But I agree that it's a bit confusing. Um, so yeah, and also one last thing. So in a lot of these exercises, you'll see, she always mentions like some kind of like uh, company that is transporting the product, like in this case, the talking company. You don't care about them. They're completely irrelevant, okay? Like just focus on who is the sender and who is the buyer and don't care. you don't need to care about all these like interme- intermediary companies, like they don't matter at all. It's just there to confuse you. 
Ja. Um, Okay, I want to do this one, but I forgot to put an animation. So I'm going to just quickly talk it like this. So Gary runs premises from home properties where Popman is destroyed in a fire, but it's not the fault of either party. Most likely, Gary is no longer obligated to pay rent. Um, yeah, I just wanted to make this clear. There's no property anymore, so he doesn't have to pay rent. But that doesn't mean that he would have, but he would be entitled to a refund, right? Because before he had full access to the apartment, and also would be unfair if he had to continue to pay the rent. So that is false. And an escrow account is like an account you use for mortgage and stuff a lot of times. So that's um, just irrelevant here. But yeah, I just wanted to go over this because maybe it's not clear. But just think of like, is the property still here or not? Okay, because he's renting. A property. So if a property is gone and no one's responsible, he just doesn't have to pay rent. Um, okay. This one, I think it's confusing. So, and a cons here you have to really be careful with rewarding, okay? So, in a consolidation, consolidation, two more corporations combine in such a way that only one corporation continues to exist. Is this true or false? What do you think? Okay, nice. Consolidation, I cannot pronounce this word. Um, so, two more companies combine in such a way that only one corporation continues to exist. That's wrong. None of them continue to exist, and a new company is formed, okay? And in a merger, okay, in a merger, what happens here is that two companies will merge, and then only one of them continues to exist. That's the difference. Basically, imagine like a merger is one company eating the other, while like a consolidation is they basically just I don't know, eat each other and something new happens, okay? But that's like the difference, okay? So merger, one of the old companies stays and consolidation, it's completely new. So just don't confuse it. Yep, oh, okay. So this is for negligence. I just wanted to get over it once. Um, so a restaurant was storing reused cooking oil in a tank pending pickup by an old retrieval company or recap. The tank has malfunctioned and the restaurant called the repair company for service. The repair company failed to respond in a timely manner. The restaurant continued to have used oil added into the tank. A restaurant employee, John, was injured while pouring oil into it. He was burnt. He was not wearing protective clothing. John sued the restaurant for negligence. The following reasoning is correct. One, there was a damage, John was burned. Two, the restaurant owed a duty of care to ensure safe premises to its employees. Three, the restaurant breached its duty of care because it did not provide protective clothing. And four, this breach of duty of care was approximate cause of the damage as if the restaurant had stopped asking John to add more oil to the tank, John would not have been injured. So conclusion, all four steps of the four step reasoning were fulfilled. The restaurant was negligent and therefore liable to John to whom they had to pay damages. Is this true or false? Take some time to really read through it. Wait 10 more seconds, maybe, for some people. Okay. It seems 
Like we all agree. Yep. So this is true. And actually this exercise is nice because it's really giving you a way of thinking. I think negligence, it's really easy if you just follow the steps. It's it's nice because you really just have like a step-by-step thing already, right? So in this case study, you always have to ask yourself, was there damage? Was there duty of care? Was there a breach of duty of care? And um, was a did that breach of duty of care? Um, sorry, was that breach of duty of care of approximate cause of damages? To just say that a bit simpler, because maybe approximate cause sounds like a bit complicated. This just means like, is that breach of duty of care responsible for the damage? Um, I think in class, she gave an example once about a guest who slipped, who, who, who like slipped, I don't know, in the staircase. And then the question is like, was there breach of duty of, of care or not? So it depends if the guest slipped because for example, I don't know, the, the staircase was super slippery because someone had cleaned and they didn't put like a please be careful sign or something, then yes, the breach of duty of care was proximate cause, right? But if a guest slipped for another reason, um, maybe the floor was still slippery because the hotel still had this breach of duty of care, but the guest slipped for another reason than that. Um, that means that there wasn't a proximate cause to the damage. And so the hotel is not negligent, if that makes sense. Really proximate cause of the damage, it means like, was that breach of duty of care directly responsible to the damage or not? Um, yeah, I think to answer all these legal questions, what really helps is to look exactly at what is asked for you, and then you reread the case study or the text or whatever, and you filter out the information. And then it will really help you. Yep, I think that's it for my questions. Yes, okay. I don't know if you guys have more questions. Um, Laurent, I can also go over, because I skipped. I can go over this one again. But that's the one you did for the midterm as well, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, uh, it's, I don't know. It's one of corporation. Like, if people want, I can explain it again or not. Thoughts, but the recording, I mean, is online there. So, unless. So, we. <laughs> you can. Um, for me, you can. Absolutely. But. I'm not no, sure. I mean. I just quickly, I'm not going to go over the whole thing again because there's a recording online and stuff, but I think this exercise like a typical example where you read each assignment, like each sentence was a number one, and you look, aha, uh -huh, okay, the corporate way was pierced because yet yeah, the shareholders pressing a lie. What, what does that mean? Like, is that actually true? And then you check in the text, right? So I feel like if you just blindly read the case study, you're really going to lose a lot of time, actually. You don't, you don't even really have to read the case study first. You can even just look at the actual questions first and then read the case study with that in mind. So you can really filter out information. Um, yeah, and then generally speaking, just be careful because, of course, like some words have like one meaning in the normal English language we use every day and then a different meaning in like legal, the legal world. So just be careful, like just know your definitions. And I think just doing the quizzes helps a lot. And um, yeah, that's kind of it for me. So if you have any other questions, feel free. You can also email me. If you have like a question during the weekend, it's fine. I will answer probably. This is my email address. And yeah, it's all good for me apart from that. So I don't know. If you have any more questions. For me, it's all good. Thank you for tonight. Okay. Thank you. I could send you. Then, yeah. I don't well, know if I you muted. I can send you a question actually that I had. Okay. <laughs> you're welcome. You're welcome. Okay. Well, I was to answer Laurent's question, but yep. Thank you guys. Have a nice weekend and nice studying. Uh, yeah, wait, Carmen. I also have I will, a question on this. I will just read Carmen's question and then we're going to the copyright. So you mean the question I went over or like in general? Okay.
Um, okay, so, so basically, I think what is important is to not confuse like copyright and privacy issue. I will give you an example. Like, let's imagine um, I have a restaurant and okay, I'm just waiting for you. What are you typing? <laughs> okay, I will just wait for you to finish typing to make sure. But Sorry, I finished typing range. Oh, okay, okay. It's just uh, yeah. team about being weird. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so let's imagine, I'll give you an example, okay? So let's imagine I have a restaurant and then Laurent is my guest at the restaurant. And um, I take pictures of like a bunch of guests at the restaurant because I needed like for marketing for my Instagram, whatever. And I take a picture of Laurent as well. And I don't ask for a permission before I upload it, upload it and I just do. And then she, a few days later, she's like scrolling on Instagram and she sees it and she's like, what the hell? And then she sues me. So here she would sue me for breach of privacy, okay? Not for copyright infringement. So that's the first example. Then the second one to compare is like, let's imagine I take these photos again. So of course, as soon as you make anything creative, right, doesn't matter what, it's your um, IP, right? It's your copyright. So um, let's say I take these photos and I uploaded upload them, but this time I asked everyone for permission and stuff. So all is good. I did nothing wrong. And everyone knows these photos are on my, under my copyright. There's a little C on the picture, blah, blah, blah. And then someone else steals these pictures and uses them, I don't know, like for a blog or something, uses them for a presentation, like for a presentation, without asking me. That's a copyright issue. That's a um, breach of, no, but co yeah, copyright infringement, sorry. That's a copyright infringement because they took my picture that I made, okay? But it's not a privacy breach because they didn't necessarily breach my privacy at all. It's just copyright because it's my work. So that's, I think, the difference. And then for like privacy and data privacy, as I mentioned, like the difference is just data is everything that you put out as an individual. Like let's say Lauren, when she went to my restaurant, she actually um, booked in advance because she wanted to be sure to have a table, right, Lauren, as you do. And then like she put a bunch of personal information already. And then I actually share that information with people I wasn't supposed to share it with, let's say like a marketing company, whatever, like someone I was not supposed to share it with, but it's like a data privacy issue because that's her data that she shared. But um, let's say Lorraine is famous, which we all know she is, and then we see her just like walking around at night and some paparazzi take pictures of her and upload them, like that's a privacy issue. But I have right? a question about this. Mm -hmm. Because actually, you're allowed to take pri uh, pictures of everyone you want if they're in public, no? Yeah, I think that's also, a, you know, the question I put in the presentation, it confused me as well, because, because I was thinking of that twist, too. It's not very clear whether she was walking in her night clothes in her garden or in her... Because if, mm -hmm. if she would be walking on the street, then I don't see a privacy issue here, because you're allowed to take pictures. You're, you can't really use them for commercial purposes but you can i could take a picture of her and post it on my instagram and say i see miley cyrus walking your night clothes like from what i understood you can do this so i think it's that you cannot zoom in or something mm -hmm. yeah like the thing is of course there's public uh places let's say like a stadium or whatever like these type of places you actually enter into a contract with the stadium or whatever like as soon as you're there you basically accept that pictures will be taken of you so like when you buy these type of tickets you will, it's not explicitly written anywhere like let's say you're going to a concert maybe some journalists might take pictures of you you can be like oh Lohan is so happy at this concert blah 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 then you can't complain because you actually made the choice to be there right but, but then because the um, I, I but know then, I, I looked at it and I was not sure myself so I Looked it and up, and from what I understood, you can actually, when someone is just walking on the street, you can take a picture of that person and do whatever you want with it, think, as long as you don't use it for commercial use, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But here in that question, for example, in the presentation, it was that... Wait, let me just yeah, read it. Yeah, it wasn't specific, so. um, But then um, I... 
think it's like it's a bit vague, right? Because for example, the thing I, I showed you earlier, it was like a professional photographer managed to take a picture of a celebrity. So here it's more like we assume since it's a professional photographer that he will upload it, right? Because that's kind of his job. Yeah. So it's more so, about like assuming. But yeah, if you don't do anything with a photo, it's fine. Um, but I think also like I'm not an expert on this, but it's just probably like a law that doesn't really work anyways in real life because if you look at it like celebrities, they get people take pictures of them all the time, like on the street and stuff, you know. And that would technically also be like a privacy breach because they are being uploaded and used for criminal, like paparazzis, for example, you know. But they still do it. I think I don't know. I, I guess that at some point it's it gets so much that it can't really be stopped. Um, but I think this is more like in theory you shouldn't upload pictures of anyone. But yeah, but I don't know if that made it more clear, Carmen. But like, just. I think most important is just to know the difference between like privacy breach, data privacy, and and yeah, as Laurent kind of said, just make sure that you know whenever is the picture actually being reused for commercial use or not. So is it being uploaded and stuff or not? Yep. Okay, I think it's clear yeah, now. Thank you. You're welcome. And wait, wait, Laurent, I will look at your question. Uh, my team is so slow. Okay, I will go. Ah. Um, it's this one. Franchise. Um, uh, uh. Oh, this actually goes with the question I put yeah, as well. Yeah, but here it's that's why I dropped it because here it's like says that they're legal forms of business organizations, and then it's false. But they could be no, so I don't understand. Because that's the thing. So we are we have four legal forms: it's sole proprietors, partnerships, LLC, and corporations that you know, oh, right? It can be any additional. Okay, then I misunderstood. Like it's not another business organization. They can be exactly. one of these business organizations, but not. They're not another. Basically, they're not, not independent yeah, in exactly. that sense. All right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Good. Because that's see, like franchises. Are a distinct legal form of business organization? Like, no, they are not. Okay, yeah. They're not form, they are, I guess, I, I a guess I misunderstood model. the question. Yep, yep, yep. 